I'm speaking today with the team behind PodCat, a podcast that serves as a forum for professional development, as well as for shop talk for the world's researchers in the field of catalysis and chemical engineering. I'm going to pause for a few seconds while everybody looks at the show notes or the video description and goes ahead and subscribes to PodCat. I'll wait. Okay, that's enough time. Um, and uh, joining me today are the three hosts of PodCat, Mark Porosoff, Tom Senfley, and Ezra Clark. So thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks for having us. Why is it that the field of homogeneous catalysis is confined to chemistry departments while the field of heterogeneous catalysis is found mostly in chemical engineering departments? Well, that's a good one. Uh, well, I think the, the one of the main reasons from what I see it as is that heterogeneous catalysis plays a huge role in the chemical industry. And of course, chemical engineers are the ones who design the, the the unit operations and the processes that that we use are, are that are behind the large number of chemical transformations that enab enable our daily lives. Yeah, I think chemical engineers just didn't want to take that extra step of having to separate out the uh, homogeneous mm -hmm. catalyst, right? So we could eliminate <laughs> one unit from our process flow diagrams. That's what we'll do. <laughs> yeah, I th I think. I think Tom and Ezra make great points. Um, I maybe chemical engineers like uh, just I think heterogeneous catalysts are just more complex and can be harder to work with. You don't have just the nice neat active site, and maybe chemical engineers just like venturing into this messier world a little bit more, where you really got to get your hands dirty. Unless maybe you're Tom and you work in computers well, well maybe it's you know as an engineer at the end of the day sometimes you don't really care how it works as long as it works mm -hmm. so yeah. maybe we don't need a uh, beautiful molecular recognition at the active site we just need something that works so i used to teach a graduate seminar on organic nanomaterials and it was cross-listed and co-taught between myself in nano and chemical engineering and my colleague, Nate Janeski, who was at the time at uh, UCSD, is now at Northwestern. And I used to tell the students that the chemistry part, so Nate's part, was polymers as molecules, and my part was polymers as materials. And I think that the engineer's approach is often looking at somewhat more dispersed systems and actually being okay with the lack of of uh, mono dispersity. <laughs> and I, I do find some irony in the fact that the, I'll get myself into hot water quickly here, but the political leanings of chemists and other natural scientists tend to be a, li a little bit more uh, liberal and engineers tend to be a little bit more conservative. And yet it is the engineers who are tolerant of the disorder in polymeric materials and <laughs> heterogeneous catalysts. And I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it's a thought mm -hmm. that, uh, that entertains me. There was a discussion at the ASCHE uh, chemical reaction and catalysis division meeting, maybe one or two years ago, where somebody, I don't remember who said this, brought up the idea that to be more inclusive, the chemical engineering catalysis community should bring in homogeneous catalysis people. And I was just thinking, I don't understand because it's like, there's a whole ACS meeting. There's a whole chemistry part of this where all of that fits in. And I think at that stage, you're starting to become more chemistry than chemical engineering. And I think the subject gets a little muddled and too broad for what really what, where really is the line between chemistry and chemical engineering in terms of catalysis? I don't know. Do you think that that line is something that is worthwhile in the way we train students? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in, in engineering, you always start from the application and, and the, you know, the function and, 
And whereas chemistry starts more from the fundamentals, kind of the, you know, how the electrons are moving around. And the, so uh, for, for me, I, I sort of see that, you know, the way we train, the, the starting point in the perspective is very different. And with engineers, kind of like what Tom was saying, you know, we care about if it works or not. And, and, and it needs to work on a big scale. And uh, so I think that that's sort of the distinction in my mind. So if you could on my kind of first day of um, class, one of the intro or intro courses in chemical engineering, I kind of break down the word engineer. Um, and so most of us think of the word engineer as someone who works with engines, right? And that kind of is that practical sense. But then you go a little bit deeper about what an engine, well, you know, where does that come from? It's closely related to the word genius, right? Ingenuity. Um, and so it's not you know, engines that go, right? It's the ingenious application of science. And so I think that's really where maybe engineers have gotten this reputation of, you know, I'm going to go out and build something with my hands, but, you know, our roots are ingenuity, right? And so I don't know if we really need such a stark distinction between chemistry and chemical engineering, right? We both have to apply kind of knowledge in a so-called ingenious way. I think there definitely are clear differences in the education. And I think a lot of it comes in with how chemical engineers treat transport. I think that's one of the big differences, especially teaching graduate kinetics. If I have a chemistry student, when you start to get into heat and mass transfer, that's something that they really, if they come in with a chemistry background, they really aren't thinking about that as much. And I think that's really because we have this solid fluid interface that we're always thinking about in heterogeneous catalysis that doesn't exist in uh, homogeneous catalysis. Yeah, mass transport limitations, right? That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> they always have yeah. to, you know. There's also a math, <laughs> the math barrier too. Um, mm. I, Philosophically, though, and I don't mean to put too fine a point on this, and this is definitely a soapbox issue for me, but fundamentally, synthetic chemists are doing engineering. They may not be doing very much math beyond arithmetic, but they are designing something, a drug, a catalyst, a material that's supposed to serve a purpose and have some sort of properties. And maybe, I guess, the in, in some cases, people have more or less of a penchant to understand mechanism and the movement of electrons on a very fine scale that might be one source of, uh, of perhaps differentiation. But anyway, just, uh, just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, if you could change one thing about undergraduate training in catalysis or chemical engineering as a whole, what would it be? Oh, I would like to get the students doing more, th you know, give them more exposure to project-based learning, get them into the lab. Uh, I, I would like to see every undergraduate spend some time in the lab, actually, uh, or at the computer, um, if they're more inclined to, to doing that sort of thing. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I really wanted to do something that felt real, that felt like it was going after a real problem that the world really needed to solve. And I spent a lot of time as an undergraduate bouncing around in different majors. I think I switched my major six times. And a lot of it was like I was just searching for a place where I felt like I was doing something real and not just busy work, you know, homework assignments. And it really wasn't until I found the lab and, and lab work that I found that I started to feel like I was doing something that was really worth my time. And um, and that experience totally changed the trajectory of my life. I never had thought about going to graduate school. I had never thought about being a professor before, um, but I got into the lab and I really found a lot of meaning there. And uh, and so, you know, I think just that experience of, of taking what you're learning in the classroom and putting it into practice to solve a real problem, um, you know, be it a, you know, something big or something small, 
it, it gave me just a, not only did it allow me to really appreciate what I was learning, but it really just gave me a sense of purpose. And that's really what got me going um, and really what ultimately allowed me to get to where I'm at now. What were your other five majors? Oh, God. <laughs> I'll tell you some of them, but some of them are too embarrassing to have on the on any written record. <laughs> was anthropology one of them? That was one of mine. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, so... Um, uh, I actually started as a bioengineer uh, because I thought, you know, I, I, I came from a family that was mostly like artists and there weren't really any science, engineering, math people in my family. So I didn't really have that kind of uh, that kind of example of what to do uh, or the guidance of what to pursue. And so growing up as a science math person, you know, the kind of definition of success was being a doctor. Uh, so I kind of started uh, undergrad with that as the goal. And I got a few years in and realized that I really wasn't into medicine, really didn't enjoy biology that much. Uh, and so I started the, the the change and I spent a little bit of time in most engineering departments actually, but there were a few forays outside of the College of Engineering that are too embarrassing to repeat here. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're here, Ezra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, you know, believe it or not, I actually did a, I did like a build your own major for a little while. I actually also spent a part of a, you know, a couple. I think it was about a month or two as a religious studies <laughs> major. Um, I, I actually at one point thought about and. and pursued switching into exercise science <laughs> um, and I remember I went to the professors uh, of the exercise <laughs> science department and uh, it was like a bunch of washed up coaches <laughs> that were all like in a big room that smelled kind of like a locker room and uh, I remember I was talking to the guy and um, and um, you know about five minutes into the conversation I and I realized, like, I think I'm smarter than this guy is. And uh, I don't think I could listen to this guy for more than ne the next five minutes. Uh, and uh, so that was, that's the full embarrassing story. Do you think it's a trope? And, and we'll turn it over to Mark and Tom to uh, take this thread where you've, where you've put it, Ezra. Um, but do you think it's a trope that engineers don't have an artistic side and that uh, we just like numbers and order and? Um, I would say, you know, maybe, you know, I don't really resonate with that myself. I grew up doing a lot of art with my family and, and um, as a kid and uh, and I actually really, when I was an undergrad, we had to take an engineering drafting course. It was kind of like art for engineers. You had to draw, you know, you were given different views of a, of a part and you had to draw a three-dimensional version of it or, or you had a three-dimensional part and you had to draw the different uh, two-dimensional views. And, uh, and I remember really enjoying that class actually. And, and I actually find that Kind of the I don't do a lot of art these days, um, but I actually find that it comes up quite a lot when I'm trying to design something. Just being able to kind of imagine the part in my mind and how it all fits together, and and just drawing up sketches uh, of the parts. And um, I know I've uh, uh, you know I've, I've definitely seen the appreciation on the machine shop uh, <laughs> person's face when I come in with a with a fully uh, detailed drawing. Uh, I, I, I um, so, you know, and I think, you know, writing, you know, telling a story and, you know, you know that comes into kind of crafting your paper and uh, making a compelling uh, presentation. So I, I find a lot of aspects of, of uh, those things come into play. It may not be in the way that we're used to seeing them, but I think the elements are there. Uh, and and kind of developing that part of your brain can really facilitate uh, you know the science as well. Tom, artistic yeah, side. Ed. Yeah. So uh, you know, I just, again, it gets back to the word engineer, right? Ingenuity. It takes creativity to solve problems, right? And that's very closely related to art. And 
I myself cannot draw, like I have no art skills, but I can appreciate other forms of, of art. Um, and, you know, I think having that part of yourself developed really helps, especially if you're going to go into academia, right? Because there's this whole aspect of selling the idea in kind of an elegant way. And that is critical, right? Getting the, you know, the right math to solve the problem is part of it, but also being able to convey those ideas clearly and in a beautiful way, right? That's where it really can take off. It's a science, it's um, a, so, yeah. yeah, it's a psychology experiment, right? Every grant proposal yeah. you write, there's, there's some combination of words in the right order that is going to get you the funding and you have to yeah. trigger the right. I think about that all the time when I'm writing, I'm like, you know what, this idea is good. <laughs> I just have to put the words in the right order. Mm -hmm. And it gets back to back, back to art. I think it was I think it was Michelangelo or one of these sculptors that said that the statue is already in the block of marble. I just chip away everything that's not there, right? And I, I always think of that when I'm starting to write a proposal, right? I just have to get all the you know, bad ideas out, um, mm -hmm. and you know, only the good ones will be will be left. Mm -hmm. um, and so, on the point of kind of the road not taken and other majors that we had, so I um, did a, a double major with philosophy. Um, which also doesn't seem to be connected to engineering, but you know, in, in philosophy, that's where you have to write a paper and you have to defend an argument with logical precision, um, and that's what we do, right? In writing papers and writing proposals, so it, you know, to me, that was an extremely valuable, you know, tangent. You know, some might say I should have just taken more electives that were science and engineering, uh, but the skills I learned in philosophy, you know, I use, you know, more often. Um, than maybe some of the electives I could have taken. So, yeah. you know, I, I think having that broader horizon is, is critical. Yeah, I, I would echo the comments that I made about art and artistic ability in, in this field and academia in general. Um, I'm not a good artist, but the more I write proposals, the more I think about how much the presentation matters as much as the science. It's probably almost equal parts present the way you present the data and the data itself. And so in crafting the proposals, like I spent a lot of time thinking about does the, if somebody looks at this, is it easy to find the main ideas or are the figures clear? Can you look at the figure for 30 seconds and immediately figure out what they're, what, what's, what's being conveyed? Um, like, do I have, pages that start with just like three lines of text and it's really awkward. So just trying to make all of these things fit together really nicely in a way to make like the, the, the appearance of the proposal itself look really nice. So if you want to read through it, I don't know how much time someone's going to spend reading my proposal, probably on the shortest end, five minutes on the longest end, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. I don't know. Um, depending on how thorough they are, how many proposals they have. So these things like how it's presented and how pleasing it is to the eye and the colors and all of these things. And it's, I think there's, there's definitely art there and it's um, there's an art to how you do all of these, yeah. these, these things, things with the, and that's all aspects, not just proposals, but how you give talks, how they're structured, the, the making a poster, how, how to set it up, the visuals, all of these things. I remember Tom actually specifically, you won, first prize of some poster competition. I don't remember what it was for. Maybe it was GRC. I think it was and I think afterwards you said something like pretty pictures. That's it. Like yeah, that's, no, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of those, you know, for good or bad, we all make a snap judgment about something when we see it before we even start reading it. Um, and that's, you know, not good for science, right? Because obviously it's the content that matters, but, you know, you got to <laughs> take whatever advantages you can get. And if it looks nice, you know, that's at least one more thing in your, uh, you know, in your, on your, on your side. And yeah, I remember that poster, just making sure the figures looked really nice. You know, in my opinion, the science was pretty good too, but you know, I do think it was the pictures that <laughs> put it over the edge, right? Okay, you know, so, I, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Ezra, sorry. Uh, oh, so I say, you know, I, I actually see a lot of art in the day-to-day -day science as well. Uh, I, especially like when you're doing something like microscopy, you know, I, I used to do a lot of microscopy. I remember just finding myself thinking, oh, that looks really cool. Like I'm gonna spend some time here and, and try to image this 
cool structure that I see. And I, it was totally unrelated to what I was trying to learn. <laughs> and I actually, I can't really see them, but I've got um, different microscope images that I've taken uh, hanging up around my office. Uh, and, um, you know, so for me, I really tie it in. Uh, I, I see a lot of overlap uh, personally. And, and um, sometimes I try to explain this to, to my family and make them, you know, care about the things that I do, but because uh, uh, it's sometimes kind of hard for them to relate to to to, uh, to my work, and um, I don't know. I don't know if I've convinced them or not, but uh, I get skeptical eyes. How do you come up with your research ideas? And in particular, can you think of a moment when you made a connection? This is something that actually you ask your guests, um, where you made a connection and it clicked that that needs to be a proposal or that needs to be a, a project. Yeah, for me, uh, I constantly have an internal dialogue going uh, about the things I, that I'm working on at the moment. And a lot of the, the my aha moments have come uh, at completely random times, totally unexpected. Uh, while I'm having this internal dialogue. And I, uh, one of the most recent ones, uh, I was actually in the shower, kind of imagining what it would be like to present this project that I've been working on with my group. And there's this one question, this one particular part of the project where uh, it's kind of like, we haven't figured this thing out yet. <clears throat> and I was kind of imagining someone asking me like, oh, what about that thing? And uh and just on the spot, I was like imagining what how I would respond to that question, like on the fly. And I just, in my mind, just said like a great idea how to solve the problem. And uh, immediately got out of this. I was in the shower. I got out of the shower and, uh, you know, typed it up to my student. Like, this is what we have to do. Uh, so for me, it's just kind of keeping it in your mind and and that you, you'll find inspiration in the most random times. I remember one of the first projects I was working on as an undergraduate, actually, we were working on a um, an atmospheric plasma discharge where we would pour metal powders down through it to generate nano wires and, and uh, base materials at a gram scale kind of production. And we were having this problem where the particles were all clumping together and, uh, weren't dispersing nicely and we didn't really know what to do and at the time we were kind of like scooping these powders in and I remember I was watching tv and I saw a commercial for an ultrasonic toothbrush uh and it was kind of talking about how the ultrasonic vibrations just you know made the plaque just disperse and I saw that I got up and I got my toothbrush and I smashed it I took the motor out and I rigged up this little powder feeder uh and uh, and the next day we were, you know, going and, and it was working. And um, so, you, you know, you never really know when inspiration is going to strike. And I think just keeping your science just in your mind uh, and just kind of keeping it back there and kind of working with it, uh, you know, all the time. For me, that's kind of the, what, what has worked. Um, mm. that, I think it brings up. Sorry, I was just going to say that the thing in the shower, I don't know what it is. That's where all my good <laughs> ideas come to, or, you know, all my ideas. And it's it really close to the like... coffee, I think. That's why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, but I, it gets to the point where, like, I'll be thinking about something. And a common one is also I'm giving a presentation, and then there's something that's not right. And then I say a joke, and everyone laughs. I don't know. In my mind, this is what I <laughs> think of things as going. Yeah. But it's, it's glad to hear that somebody else also, this must be a common a common thing. <laughs> But it gets to the point where I'm in the shower that I'll forget where I was, like if I've shampooed my hair or you know, washed my face, like so I just have to start all over again <laughs> because I'll forget what step I was on. So yeah. I think I think the idea that Ezra brought up about really self-interrogating your own understanding of a problem is really key to finding inspiration. Uh, because it starts getting you down the road of, well, this is the piece that we don't really understand of this puzzle where we're kind of have some hand wavy explanation or we gloss over it and in, in the proposal. And I think when I started like this idea of turning weaknesses into strengths didn't really make sense. But in this context, it starts to 
makes sense because you think about well, we don't know so much about this particular area. So how can we design an experiment now to interrogate this phenomena that we're trying to study or, or might be affecting the system in some way? And then you can start to get a little creative and maybe come up with something new and develop a, a method or a technique or um, a set of experiments to then be able to interrogate this thing. And now you've created something new because maybe nobody else knows this, even including yourself who's an expert in this area. And you've gone on and addressed that uh, seminar question that came up in your mind. I actually got the question too later when I first presented. <laughs> so it was very useful that I had already thought, already got the question in my mind. Do you think chemical engineering has a marketing problem to prospective undergraduates? And sorry for the oh. leading question, but what do you wish that teachers and guidance counselors knew about chemical engineering? I, I think this is a big problem. So I teach the first year chemical engineering course. And I think the majority, not everyone, but the majority of students in chemical engineering are in chemical engineering because they have a close friend, family member, mentor, associate, somebody in their circle that's done chemical engineering. Otherwise, people have absolutely no idea what it is. So if I talk to an average person who is not a chemical engineer, like somebody at the gym or whatever. And they ask, oh, what do you do? I'm a professor of what? Chemical engineering. Oh, wow, that sounds really hard. What is that? Like, do you, like, they, it's it's not really well known how chemical engineers, I think, contribute to society. I think chemists, it's, people have an image in their head of someone in the lab working with small scale vials and things like that. But chemical engineers, I'm not sure what the, like, average perception is if you were to pull 100 people and have them draw a chemical engineer in their setting you'd probably get someone like sitting next to an oil pipeline yeah and i think that that's that last point that it's either they don't know anything about it or what they do know is bad press right they think about environmental problems that are caused by chemical engineers and we're just contributing to that and this is something we've touched on on our podcast several times that you know we're you know, the ones who are trying to do something about it, right? And that's the message we have to try to get through. Um, and it's just an uphill battle because, you know, it's either no impression of chemical engineering or a bad impression coming into undergraduate. Um, so, and, you know, Mark, like you said, the people who end up doing chemical engineering, they have someone in their inner circle who's done it. So they see, you know, that this person is contributing to society in a very meaningful way, right? And they understand that. Um, but if you don't have, you know, that experience of talking to someone who is a chemical engineer, it's, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of, um, you know, ways to learn about chemical engineering in a, in a positive context otherwise. How do we yeah. fix it? I think we just got to make it more clear that what chemical engineering, you know, chemical engineering today isn't what it was a hundred years ago. Uh, and that a lot of what we're trying to do now at the cutting edge of Kimmy is, you know, how do we come up with the solutions for tomorrow? How do we solve the environmental problems that we have today? And and um and and to me, that's what Kimmy is all about. And that and that Kimmy is, in my view, really the best field to go into if you really want to, uh, you know, address sustainability challenges um, and and energy efficiency challenges. Um, so for me, um, I think just making that more clear uh, to students and um, and kind of just drawing that distinction between the Kimmy of old and the Kimmy of, of the you know the twenty first century. Yeah, I think that's really important. Like for example, just this week, some press came out of the world's largest carbon capture plant coming online in Iceland, and like that is hundred percent chemical engineering. I don't know if somebody reads the CNN, CNN article, if they'll realize like, oh, this is chemical engineering, or if this is kind of, kind of environmental science. And I think that's the missing link, right? There's all these applications, like new solar cells come online. You can you read the, the general media, you'll see all of these um, things that are being implemented and you'll, you'll read about different research discoveries. But I don't think the link between the 
applied work and the fundamental research is necessarily connected to chemical engineering effectively. Yeah, you know, it's funny that I actually ended up as a chemie because I, um, every time I got the itch to change my major again, the first thing I would do is I'd print off the sheet of all the majors offered at the university and I would go through and at first I would say, what do I know I don't want to do? And I always marked off Kimmy in that first pass. I never considered Kimmy as something that was for me. And part of it was, you know, me growing up, my, my, um, my uh, parents both grew up in the Vietnam era. We're both very against the war. And, and so to, you know, kind of what I learned from them was like, you know, Kimmy is, you know, napalm and, and, uh, you know, all these bad things that, 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 um, that Kimmy was the source of all the problems. That was kind of the, the impression that I had. Um, and um, that's just not really, that, that doesn't really square with the Kimmy that I have come to know and love. It strikes yeah. me that given the fraction of chemical engineering undergraduates who go into extractive industries, uh, who go into oil and gas, that we may be suffering a bit in this conversation from a coastal bias. And I'm not sure if that's a thing or if that's also just kind of a... a you know, we the the research that we do in our labs is um, uh, you know, generally has a more, let's say, a remediative bent. Uh, but if you look at where the bulk of the money that goes to pay BS holders salaries, it's still predominantly oil and gas. I think I'm right about that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. So I, you know, I could comment because I'm uh, also I guess I have a coastal bias, but I'm on the Gulf Coast, right? <laughs> Which, um, you know, and you know, it's true, of course, that the energy industry, the oil and gas industry, is a huge part of chemical engineering. But at those companies, right, the attitude is now, you know, environmentally responsible utilization of these resources, and that can be done, right? And so even though oil and gas is you know the you know, the main driver of a lot of the jobs right that still doesn't mean that you can't be ultimately trying to you know help the environment um and i think that's another message that we could do a better job of letting our undergraduates know that you can go work for one of these big oil companies and be trying to solve the climate problems right and that mm -hmm. is the truth now right that's what all those companies you know for the most part are really trying trying to do in a serious way and um uh, you know, I, that message gets, I think, a little bit lost um, when you're trying to recruit undergraduates to, to chemical engineering. Yeah, and this this is one of the things that I try to really um, hammer into students when we have we lose sometimes students to environmental engineering, and I try to convince them not to do that because of how versatile chemical engineering is because we're learning about how heat and mass move around and the laws that govern the universe and how to apply these core courses to really any kind of application and as these oil and gas companies pivot to cleaner feedstocks and processes they're still governed by thermodynamics kinetics transport and separations and if you know those skills, you can pivot all of your pipes and tools and heat transfer and all of these things to a different feedstock. It's all kind of very similar in a lot of ways. But if you move into environmental engineering, you're going to have a much more limited breadth of knowledge that will make it, I think, harder to um, pivot your career into where things are, are, are moving. I mean, that's my own personal bias, but I think I I'd say like, if you aren't sure, do a chemi undergrad because you can get the environmental science kinds of jobs with a chemi degree, but I don't think you can get the chemi kinds of jobs with an environmental science degree where both may have a big impact on like the climate and the, these kinds of bigger problems. It strikes me talking to some students in my own courses and lab that 
young young people bless them want to have everything all at once and want to make some huge transformative change and be the effector of that change whereas if you look at that big doe chart that shows all of the inputs to the primary energy and where it all goes and you see that 60 percent of it is wasted energy that if you were to reduce friction energy losses due to friction or even just one component of friction like audible sound then you could you know reduce the waste by i don't know a percent or something which would automatically be the equivalent of i'm going to get this wrong but like doubling the number of solar photovoltaic panels in the world but you have made one localized kind of change that has this effect that you would have had to do in a transformative way in a very distributed, very difficult way. And so I think that's another argument in favor of the, the idea that you could join a traditional industry and still have a huge impact on the uh, on you know environmental degradation. Um, also, I want to make a comment about environmental uh, science is that it is such an, it's like the reason to do something is sometimes because it's hard, but why would you work against entropy in such an obvious way? Like <laughs> CO2 is everywhere. <laughs> pollutants are everywhere don't don't wouldn't it just be easier if you could focus on the production side anyway or, or uh, focus on the source um mm -hmm. it, it just uh wow that's a hard problem not saying we shouldn't do it but if you're gonna if you're gonna bet uh some money on the career of one person having an impact it's probably looking at sources <laughs> right yeah, it's a, one point I bring up in my core thermodynamics course is like you could you can make a lot of really good decisions up front just by looking at the the first law, of course, because that's the obvious one. But the second law, a little bit more subtle, uh, but that's just as valid as the first law. And there's a lot of things that are pretty obvious when you look at it from the uh, entropy perspective. Um, anyway, and then I go on for the whole semester to teach what that actually means. And there's always a little bit of a disconnect between the concept entropy and, and um, actual practical applications using it. But anyway, I won't, I could talk all day about the philosophy of thermodynamics, but I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> How did podcast start? What's the origin story? Or was there a great a story. <laughs> radioactive <laughs> catalysis spider. <laughs> It was, we're almost at the two year anniversary of the inception. Yeah, of the we're coming up on the two year anniversary. We know exactly when it started because uh, <laughs> we can trace it back to a, a bar conversation <laughs> at the uh, at the Gordon conference on, uh, on catalysis, which is once every two years. Um, and I don't I hadn't met either of you until then. no, I hadn't met you. No. Um, and then we were just chatting at the bar. I don't know what time it was. I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I can't remember if we were talking to Andy Peterson at the time or we talked to him oh, later. I think it was later, the next night. Yeah. But, but I think it kind of, uh, yeah. My recollection was that we were reminiscing on all the times we put our foot in our mouth during our faculty search um, and how many times, <laughs> you know, I wasn't prepared for something that I should have been prepared for and how I'm, embarrassing it was and how I you know I try to uh block those memories out of my my conscious mind uh and we were just kind of talking about like how I wish there had been somebody to tell me not to do those things uh, or to avoid those pitfalls and uh, we kind of started joking that that could be us could be a podcast yeah and it's like the the realization that we all have these stories of, you know, we all have screwed up and done embarrassing things. And, you know, it's not like you're not the only one who, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't do so well on an interview at, at one point. And you're like, wow, I wish, you know, I knew this. And then it like, we were like, well, we make a podcast about this. And right. it was a big joke. Um, yeah, at the beginning, it was it a total became more a and more serious. Joke. And then, so what we started doing was, it was just us three. We kind of just started pretending like we were interviewing people while we were talking to them at the bar. Mm -hmm. 
I don't even believe we even decided to do that. We just started. No, we just started doing it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great. We were like, these conversations were great. Uh, that's when we talked to Andy Peterson. And he was like, we should have had a tape re a recorder so right. that we could catch that. And, you know, and we were, we, it became pretty clear. And, like, there was a lot of enthusiasm from people that we pitched the idea to mm -hmm. at the conference. So that's where it came from. Yeah. And it, it, it transitioned very quickly because we came up with the idea – I think it was like maybe the first or second night of the conference. It was pretty early on. And the idea transitioned after sleeping on it, like transitioned from, oh, this is just a silly joke until this is like actually a pretty serious and good idea. And we should definitely do this very quickly. Like that transition um, happened fast. And I think part of it too was we wanted to bring all of these closed door conversations that can't really be accessed by PhD students who are interested in catalysis or postdocs who want to get into academia and how you navigate certain things because maybe their advisor is too high up and they don't have these conversations or things like that um, and make give those conversations to everyone in the field who's who's interested. Why do you think your colleagues agree to be guests? Why are they so enthusiastic about coming on? And also congratulations on something, keeping something alive that started as a bar conversation after a beer or two, that that actually had some staying power. Because usually like the next day, you're like, oh, that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about the Gordon conference, right? Because you're all kind of stuck there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the like something, you know, work. normal conferences, you'd have a conversation yeah. at the bar and then you get on the plane and everyone goes and then it, it dies. But we were there for six days. The conversation happened on day one. And so you right. know, That's some time, just, sure. ideas will have time to grow and to you know, become something. Yeah. Weird. And the internet does not work reliably in that place. Like you might have enough internet to check one email or send one email, and then you won't have reliable signal for like another half an hour, maybe. Do you think that's intentional? We were it wondering about it. But it worked out. Yeah. So well. yeah. <laughs> I think it, yeah, I think it is a positive thing. I think it is a positive. Uh, but you know, I wonder if more. You know, I was just gonna. Yeah. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Ezra. I was just gonna say, thinking about why people want to be on the, the podcast. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. I think a lot of people just had similar experiences that to us, the to the experiences we had that motivated us to begin this in the first place, and. And uh, they just kind of want to pay it forward in a sense. And uh, just, I mean, you, you know, you grow up and, you th and it kind of seems like, the, you know, professors and academics, they all have it all figured out. And and um, once you get into the job and you start doing it, you kind of realize that, no, you know, they really don't have it all figured out. That a lot of us are just kind of figuring out things as we go and we're just doing our best. And um, and that's all you can do. And 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 anybody's capable of doing their best, you know. Um, uh, so I guess that's from my perspective why people come on. I don't know if you guys have a different idea. I think um, you know we're professors, so any chance we get to profess, um, we will do it. <laughs> you know, it's what better way? Oh, you know, podcast or just kind of talk for half an hour about my ideas. Of course, everyone wants to know all of my ideas and hear me talk. So you know, why not? <laughs> yeah, I think I think it provides this conduit that didn't exist before, which is a means for like I think Ezra and Tom are saying to just share some of these more personal and maybe more nuanced tricks of the trade and just feelings you've gone through that like there isn't really a way to share this information with like the younger generation. Otherwise, like you can have limited conversations with your group, maybe with people at conferences, but there's never really a chance. Like, I just want to go talk to a bunch of PhD students and tell them, like, here's what you should and shouldn't do in writing your proposal. Like, there's no, there isn't really much of an avenue for that. And in this format, I think it fills that void in a way that's like with Zoom now, it's really easy and accessible. Like, I think every or most uh, faculty given the opportunity to take just an hour or so of their time to talk about some of their work, talk about some of their struggles, their successes, they're willing to invest that little bit of time. Yeah, but it's been really interesting just to hear like, everyone's 
you know, story of their path into academia. And there's a lot of commonalities, but there's so much, so many differences, right? And like, and just, I think if I was a PhD student and I heard all, all these different ways, like I wouldn't constantly be worrying, like, am I doing the right step? Because there's only one way to get through the maze and I got to do it right. And you realize there's not, right? Um, there are some better things to do and some worse things to do, um, which we also talk about. But, you know, understanding that there's not one blueprint that you have to follow I think would have been just beneficial just to know that. What was the most embarrassing thing that each of you did at an interview? Mm. Uh, well, this maybe wasn't an interview, but it, like at AICHE, um, and this was early on when I was a, P, at a PhD student, and I think it was my first talk. Um, I kicked the plug out of the wall of the projector, right? And like it, you know, mm. like everything went down and it, and so I don't know. I always tell my students, like, you're nervous about your first talk in a national conference, right? It won't go worse, hopefully, than, than my first talk. Um, and, you know, it, it worked out. My career wasn't over after doing something like that. So Usually the audience members are pretty, um, pretty tolerant of those types of malfunctions i, it, I it think gives everyone extra... saw the humor in it right that, you know, <laughs> taking the plug out of the wall accidentally when you're like a visibly nervous graduate student and they get yeah, to respond right. to another email that, without yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i think for me, i'm sorry i think for, i think for for me it wasn't really something that, that i did it was more something that happened to me um i was in the middle of a Skype because this was before Zoom interview and my computer just shut off. And then and it was like, well, that's unusual. It never happened before. So I turned it back on, logged into the meeting. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Like totally flustered after that happened. And then it happened again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I switched to my phone or something just to like, get the connection but like at, at that point yeah that was that was it and i don't think i ever heard from from that <laughs> university again <laughs> boy i have so many that i don't even really know where to begin i think one i was in europe at the time and uh, i was in denmark and there was a six hour time difference between between denmark and where i was interviewing at for all year long except for about one week <laughs> and that one week happened to be the week uh, that I was doing interview stuff. And so uh, I ended up being like an hour late to some really important uh, meetings because uh, because the time difference, I just, the time, that one week of the year where the time difference was different than it always was every other part of the year. Oh, I, it seemed like every time that, that time of the year rolled around, I had some kind of important meeting scheduled with someone on the East Coast that I ended up missing. Uh, so that was definitely one. I, I remember being, um, I think so much of, of what we do in grad school is talk about our research with experts in the field. And I remember my very first phone interview, um, you know, kind of went into it thinking, oh, I can just wing this, you know, it won't be a big problem. Uh, and I remember like one of the very first questions was like, tell me why I should care about your research. And I got into it and I, I remember thinking like, oh, like this is kind of the the pitch for the expert not for the general audience and kind of tried to backpedal a little bit and and realize that I had I really should have practiced like how to sell my science in two minutes to someone who didn't know anything about catalysis and uh um and, and just kind of really put my foot in my mouth with that and then the last one that I really remember uh was um I was interviewing at a at a European university where they bring in external experts, um, and you don't really know who you're going to get. So there's always this kind of wild card, and the person who they brought in uh, had, had worked on some stuff that was somewhat similar to to what I did, but I didn't realize who it was at the time, and uh, and I sort of kind of. Uh, uh, I won't say insulted there for the word, but uh, you know, uh, kind of sort of was a little overly critical without realizing that it was them who I was being critical about. Uh, and that, so those were the three uh, things I would prefer to forget if I can manage one day. 
<laughs> You're laying it all out there uh philosophy yeah. major and <laughs> not one but three potentially career ending yeah. <laughs> right. then, you, know, you, you can't beat that you know <laughs> and i'm still here so it's okay <laughs> tom yeah tom do you have a uh, uh sorry I'm embarrassing be- moment yeah. Well, I, my embarrassing moment was the kicking the plug out of the wall. Um, but all of my interviews, those went great. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <Just I'm, perfect. laughs> I'm sorry. It was it was Mark that I <laughs> didn't get to. What's that? The Mark did we I all did. do the embarrassing moment thing? We did. Yeah, what we I, did. I, I, Mark, yeah, my computer shut itself off. Oh. That's the other good story about thing about embarrassing stories, right? You replay it in your own mind over and over again, the... but other people forget about it immediately. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm like, yeah, that's a good. You know? Who's who's paying this guy to be a podcast yeah. host? Speaking of embarrassing moments, yeah. um, you get paid. <laughs> we, we don't. Yeah. I guess you, you, you were probably replaying your embarrassing moments. I was. I was. <laughs> Everyone's just yeah, you know, like oh no. <laughs> the. Well, all right. I, I owe you something something worse than that. So you know how in like an original Nintendo game or something, when you got really close to beating the boss in certain games, they started doing other tricks that they didn't do earlier. Like mm-hmm. uh, I, Mega Man has a few of these characters and they're like almost dead. You almost got them. And then they just flail and do do some new thing. And so I had uh, seven interviews and six rejections before I arrived on site at my seventh interview. And that was at UCSD. And I'm like, well, what I'm doing is not working. People are telling me that like my research ideas aren't going to get funded or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but, but I was, I was a reasonably successful postdoc and had, had some papers as a, as a grad student, I'm like, can't, can't they see? So <laughs> I told the chair of the department who ultimately hired me, so maybe this worked, although I'm humiliated to think about it now, that quote, I really want to kick ass. <laughs> 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 and that was a mistake. And going back again, I probably would not have said it, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he wanted to hear that from <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I want to point out that uh, when I was looking to do a career transition, um, it occurred to me today that I interviewed at all three of your schools. <laughs> and <laughs> I was very, and those were my, my three interviews were at Rice, Penn State, and <laughs> U of R. <laughs> and it didn't occur to me t- until today just how damn improbable that is. Uh, it wasn't in the chemi department uh, at Penn State or Rice, but I did. I, <laughs> but, but there was a, by the skin of my teeth, I'm Mark's colleague as of July mm-hmm. and not Ezra or Tom's colleague. <laughs> that's really <laughs> small world. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I remember. I remember when we were just to go back for a second discussing podcat and starting it up. One of the things that got us sold on it being a good idea was we had thermal catalysis, uh, DFT, and electric catalysis. We were like, oh, we have all the bases covered, and so <laughs> pillars that, it was chemical engineering, right? And it was just a coincidence because we were just like talking. I don't know. We just were talking to each other, and it wasn't like we sought each other out to talk. Like I would think I was just talking to Tom because we knew each other and. Ezra was around and I don't know, just kind of all came together. Well, if you really want to extend a bridge to the chemistry community, you could think about having like an organometallic homogeneous solution phase person. Just saying, Mm. just kidding. They can have their own (laughs) podcast. (laughs) Oh, and before, before I go, um, Tom and Mark, tell me the most embarrassing thing that you just, (laughs) Um, uh, well thank you very much for uh for for coming on and uh, this is really fun good luck uh with with everything and 
everyone listening, watching, please subscribe to PodCat. Uh, these folks are doing an awesome job supporting members of the, uh, of the catalysis and chemical engineering community, especially early career uh, researchers. So check it out and I'll see you next time.